Today's scripture passage comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1-3. through 3. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? 
the letter of First Corinthians is written to the church as it is dealing with the messy conflicts of being in community. How do we do this messy life together? Uh, that's kind of the question. Paul is addressing this problem. And, and we have to understand, again, that the, the problem that Paul is addressing is with the church. It's not with the people who are on the outside. He is addressing a problem inside the church. He is addressing Christians, those who really should know better. He is trying to help the church understand its identity and, and how does it do life together, especially in a pagan world. And as we talked about last week, the city of Corinth, where the church is located, is a major metropolitan city, wealthy city, a city seat into the culture of the Roman Empire, a culture of status and promotion and self-promotion, where it was all about climbing the social ladder. That's really the context of this book, all, all about relationships, but for my own benefit. I'll be friends with you if you help me in my status. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at this whole letter of 1 Corinthians from Paul to the church in Corinth, and we're spending seven weeks on this letter. So I want to invite you as we are in week two. If you haven't watched week one, I would encourage you to go back and watch week one, but we're looking at this whole letter of 1 Corinthians. So I would encourage you to read the whole letter together. This is going to be a little bit deeper uh, sermon as we kind of dive into the text a little deeper. Uh, and, and again, the whole, the whole issue we're dealing with is how do we do this messy life together as the body of Christ, the church? And, and, and Paul is reminding the church that they have to live differently from the rest of the world. And it's a delicate balance because we aren't called to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. We're, we're actually called to live in the world, but to learn how to transform the world instead of letting the world transform us. And Paul really is kind of walking a tightrope as he is trying to create a community, a group of Christians that is walking together with a, with a clear sense, a clear moral sense and theolo theological identity. Uh, yet this group, it's made up of all different kinds of people you have a Jew and, uh, and Gentile, you have slave and free, male and female. So how does he hold this community together? Uh, and, and really, the, part of the questions we're asking is, is what's acceptable in the church that's not acceptable, uh, you know, or that would be acceptable in the world, and what things are acceptable in the world and not acceptable in the church? These are kind of the questions that Paul is addressing as he's really trying to mold and shape this motley crew. And we also have to understand uh, that as we approach 1 Corinthians, he's not giving us all of his thoughts and a theological premise about a certain topic. But really, Paul is writing to address the problems of this community and helping them to understand their identity together. And they are some of the same problems that the church has today. So I think it has something for us today. And if you remember, if you watched last week, one of the first issues that Paul addresses is wisdom. The world's wisdom versus the wisdom of God. The wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of the cross, really. Uh, and we read 1 Corinthians 3.19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And Paul really is kind of chastising this group, this church, because they're still living under the wisdom of the world. And what's fascinating is that most of the problems that the church is dealing with, these are issues uh, that, that really aren't theological, but really kind of social issues. Things like status and honor, cultural values that are in opposition to Christian values, wealth, lawsuits among believers, unequal treatment of believers at communion, eating at pagan temples. These are all social issues, but they actually have a lot of theological implications. So Paul is wrestling with these issues throughout the whole letter and helping the church to understand how they live this out. They, have, they really have been born out of messy conflicts in this community. He's, he's really helping them understand how these social issues do have theological implications. So let me quote from Ben Witherington, who's a New Testament scholar. 
uh, on this very issue. And this is from his commentary on Corinthians. He says this, Paul must show that it is to the Corinthians' benefit to work together, to agree with one another on essential matters, to respect differences on less than essential matters, and to allow the good or benefit of the other to guide one's actions. He must show the future good of allowing love to govern how, when, and whether one expresses expresses one's freedom, knowledge, and gifts. I know there's a lot packed in that little quote there, but it is. What's essential? What's not essential? When do we use our freedoms? When do we withhold our freedoms? What do we, how do we use our knowledge, our gifts, and all this wrapped around the idea of love? Uh, if we were to put it in kind of Wesleyan Methodist terms, Paul is addressing the issue of sanctification how they are learning to be holy and set apart. Sanctification is just that, the process, the journey of becoming more like Jesus, growing closer to Jesus, and getting that discernment from the Holy Spirit. This isn't easy stuff. It's difficult. Uh, you, you know, if there's one thing that COVID taught us over the past couple of years, it's that as Christians, we can become pretty divided quickly over social issues. And how we handle these social disagreements have theological implications and, and, and theological implications for us as the church as well. We've wrestled with these. And Paul is wrestling with similar problems, similar questions, not probably as big as COVID necessarily, but, but big issues that are of a social nature. Um, so let's go back to our text today and look at one of the first issues after he's dealing with wisdom, the wisdom of the cross and the wisdom of Christ dying for our sins. He's continuing this theme of wisdom uh, as well uh, and, and the messy problem that Paul's trying to address. And he really doesn't put, uh, pull any punches uh, in, this, uh, in these chapters, chapter three and four. He's really writing pretty boldly. But uh, this is chapter three, verse one. And so brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh. Ouch, that's... He's saying you're not really being spiritual. As infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? Ouch. You know, Paul is getting pretty bold here, and, and he's being bold because he is the one who started this church. Uh, and he's telling the church, hey, you're acting childishly. And the proof of this childish behavior is that you are having fighting and jealousy. They really are kind of stuck. You ever feel stuck before? I know I have. They, they aren't acting out of grace and salvation that they've been given in Jesus, but, but rather they're operating out of their fleshly nature. They're operating out of the wisdom of the world and not the wisdom of the cross and who they've been called to be. And when, ta when, when Paul uses that term flesh, uh, it, it can be translated as carnal or animalistic in opposition really to what God wants. Uh, God wants us to act out of the spirit. And here the people are acting out of the flesh. So Paul is calling them out because they're allowing the world's standards to define and to set their standard. The church is using the world's wisdom to set the bar for their behavior. And Paul said, this isn't acceptable. This isn't wise. Again, we're looking at this idea of sanctification, of this gift of God, of grace to us. Uh, again, sanctification is the process of becoming holy and set apart. It's the act or process really of being set free from sin. And again, this is a gift of God. We can't make ourselves holy. We can't make ourselves set apart. Only God can. But it takes our will working with this Holy Spirit so that we can become sanctif sanctified. And, and really Paul is saying that you're, not, you're, you're stuck and you're not becoming more like Jesus you're actually becoming more like the world. You're not being sanctified. Our spiritual journey with Jesus is a journey of sanctification. And we need to be desiring to grow closer to Jesus in all aspects of our lives. And we should be asking the Holy Spirit, how are we living? Is it in opposition to you, Jesus, or is it in alignment with you? 
So these Corinthian Christians are stuck in their process of sanctification. And Paul comes down pretty hard on them because they have allowed the world's standards of wisdom to shape their life. And so we see in the very next verse, verse 4 of chapter 3, the issue that Paul is addressing. Let me read verse 4 through 9. For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? For what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe is the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. So again, let me give you a little context of what Paul is talking about here. We can piece together what has happened by using the book of Acts, which is about the early church, and cues from the text itself. But Paul, we know, is the one who started this church in Corinth. He spent about a year and a half there starting up this church before he moved on to start up other churches, to plant more churches. Then at some time after that, another disciple named Apollos came and preached as well. We don't know really how long he was there, but there's one thing we do know. Apollos was a great preacher. He knew how to preach a sermon. Uh, he was good at it. And apparently, in, in my estimation, Paul probably wasn't the best speaker. Maybe not the most engaging preacher. Remember the story in Acts where Paul is preaching on the second floor of a building and, and a guy's sitting in a windowsill up there and he falls asleep while Paul is preaching and he falls out the window, falls to his death. Paul stops preaching, he goes downstairs, he prays over him, the guy comes back to life and he goes back and continues to preach. I mean, that's a powerful moment right there. Uh, but literally, while he's preaching, someone falls asleep. Never happened to me. Just kidding. But, uh, but this is the, the, the thing. Uh, the miracle and power of God was with Paul, even though he wasn't the best of preachers. But and, and for some in Corinth, that power didn't mean much. He couldn't preach well, so they wrote him off. So there are these factions going on within the life of the church. Some say they follow Paul and others are saying they follow Apollos. You know, it's this idea of I like Hayden's preaching better than Pastor Rick's or I'm not a fan of Charlie's preaching. I, I, I belong to Pastor Rick and, and people are taking sides and quarreling over who's better. And all of chapter three and chapter four of First Corinthians is addressing this issue. Again, go back and reread this. And here's the thing, Paul and Apollos, they're on the same page. They're on the same team. They understand each other's roles. They're both called to serve the church. And in fact, later on in 1 Corinthians in chapter 16, we'll hear that Paul actually wanted Apollos to go back and visit with the Corinthians over this issue, but Apollos wouldn't go because he didn't want to cause any further division. He said, I'm going to stay back because I don't think this would be good for the church if we continue to divide over this. So in chapter 3 and 4, this is the issue Paul is addressing. This division between who are we following? These two humans. And Paul is saying to himself, this is crazy. You're not supposed to act this way. You're acting childish. And Paul uses three different metaphors to describe the situation which is going on. We just read the first metaphor, uh, kind of from farming, that Paul says, I planted, he started the church, Apollos watered. And then at the end of verse 9, Paul uh, changes metaphors from farming to building. That Paul laid the foundation and Apollos built on that foundation. And so I'm going to read uh, chapter 3, verse 10 through 19, a little bit longer. In fact, I would encourage you to get your Bible if you... If you have your Bible out, you might want to follow along in your Bible as I read a little bit longer text here that we're going to be reading. This is verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. 
Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed with fire and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves if you think that you are wise in this age. You should become fools so that you may become wise. There's that whole wisdom thing again. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. Now there's a lot of issues going on in this little metaphor and a couple of metaphors here. And it's easy to get sidetracked on some issues as we read through this section. This and let me just address a couple of those. This section isn't saying we earn our salvation, that we build on something and then we earn it. No, this section is being spoken to those who are already saved, to Christians. We need to be faithful in building up the kingdom and using good building materials to build it up. We will be rewarded for our faithfulness, but it's not about salvation. I wanna make that clear. And when it talks about us being the temple of God, uh, we tend to interpret it in kind of a Western culture mindset that's really highly individualistic. But we have this building metaphor, and he's talking about the church, that the church is the temple of God. We individually are, but really Paul is talking about the church as a whole. You know, um, the New Testament doesn't know of any Christianity that is apart from being a fellowship of believers. But we also have to realize that Paul holds individuals responsible for how they act and behave and that the fellowship, the church, is expected to discipline us if we get off track. So the second metaphor Paul is saying, I laid the foundation, Apollos built on it, and you also are building on that foundation and you're going to be responsible for how you build. Are you building up well for the kingdom or poorly? It's not about your salvation but it's about that, again, that sanctification. How are you being faithful in your journey with Jesus? Um, and the third metaphor that Paul uses is that of a manager or a steward or a servant. And we see this in the beginning of chapter four. So he goes through all of chapter three talking about this. And then chapter four, one and two, he says this. Think of us this way. As servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries, Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. So here Paul is using this third metaphor saying we are servants, we're stewards, we're managers. And as a servant of the church, as a preacher, as a leader, we have been called to, to be trustworthy and faithful, right? And then the rest of chapter 4, it is just dripping with irony and sarcasm as Paul is addressing the wisdom of these Corinthians, that's really not wisdom, and how they think they know better like a child would know better over a parent and, and that they live better than he, or, uh, and he's talking about how he brought them to the faith and all of these things. Again, as you read it, you need to read it with that eye that Paul is really laying down the hammer here as he uh, uses sarcasm and irony, just saying, you think you're better than us. You think you're better than the apostles, you know, and he said, don't fool yourself. Let's just read a small piece so you kind of get the flavor. Uh, and you'll need to read the rest on your own. But this is chapter four, verse eight through 12. He says this, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Quite apart from us, uh, you have become kings as indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we might be kings with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, as though sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to mortals. We are fools for the sake of Christ. There's that wisdom versus foolishness. But you are wise in Christ. We are weak. You are strong. You are held in honor. We are in disrepute. To the present hour, we are hungry and thirsty. We are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we grow weary from the work of our own hands. 
when reviled, we bless, when persecuted, we endure, and so on and so forth. Basically, Paul is saying, yeah, you're so rich, you have everything you need, and we're over here suffering for the gospel. And you know, you you have been blessed, you're stronger, you're you're all these things, and we're nothing. And he's really trying to point out to them how wrong and how fool-headed they have been. Uh, and I can just picture as Paul is writing this, uh, I wonder if Paul kind of had that same, uh, I can just picture Paul had had been addressed this way by his Jewish mother at some point, right? All you moms uh, out there and even dads, you know, where Paul did something wrong and his mom is just kind of chewing him out for what he did wrong. This is kind of the way Paul is addressing these Corinthians Christians as, as children. You're not being faithful. You think you're better than me. You're not, and let me prove it to you. That's really what Paul's writing about in chapter three and four. And Paul is addressing them this way because they are acting like children. So at the end of chapter four, we have the conclusion of this first major section of Paul's letter. Let me read uh, verse 20 and 21. For the kingdom of God depends not on talk, but on power. What would you prefer? Am I to come to you with a stick or with love and a spirit of gentleness? He's basically saying choose. He's telling, hey, it doesn't matter. We don't serve Paul. We don't serve Apollos. We serve Christ. And any who are servants of God, you need to show respect to. And their work will be shown in the power that they have and how they build up the kingdom. You don't judge what God will judge. And so stop acting like children. He is forcing these Corinthians to look at their lives through the lens of God's goodness and have a healthy evaluation of who they are and not a puffed up pride. He is forcing these Corinthians to rethink what it means to have power, status, wisdom. They have to break from their old ideas of wisdom and status and look at the cross to understand what living together really is. And, and as we've seen, this is messy. And Paul really is trying to get the church to have unity. This, this doesn't mean we're all uniform. We'll see later in Corinthians how we are all created different with different gifts and roles and functions, all for the purpose of building up the church, not for puffing up ourselves. That's what Paul's addressing. But we have to remember our status, it's not really in our talk, but in the power of God working through us. Let me just uh, end with kind of an example uh, that kind of reflects this. I remember when I was in preaching class in seminary. Boy, that's a tough class because nothing like preaching to a room full of preachers. It can be pretty stressful. And I remember in our preaching class, there was this woman who was in her 60s who was going to seminary. She was second career. I think she was a widow. And I was thinking to myself, you know, we even talked about this. By the time she finished seminary, she'd be close to retirement age. And I was thinking to myself, what's the purpose? You know, my wisdom was saying, you're wasting your time. Uh, and, and I kind of had to repent of all this because even when she came to give her sermon, you know, you kind of prejudge people at times. Unfortunately, we do this as humans. And I thought, man, she's this is probably not going to be a good sermon because she'd never done any public speaking of any kind. She'd never done anything like this before. So she gets up to preach. And you know, she does pretty good. Not the best sermon that we had, but here was the difference. As soon as she got up to preach, we physically felt the Spirit of God come upon the room in power. And it was mesmerizing. It was powerful. At the end of her sermon, we were literally saying to each other, did you feel that? That's the difference. It's about the power of God working through us, that we are on this journey of sanctification and we shouldn't be having these factions. Oh, he's a better preacher. Oh, he's better at this. We're not following people. We're following Jesus Christ. And it's about what Christ is doing through us that we are faithful in upbuilding the kingdom. That's what this section is about as we talk about the wisdom from God, the wisdom of the cross, which looks foolish to the rest of the world, and how we need to be living differently from the world's expectation. We look on with the eyes, but God looks at the heart. 
And that woman's sermon was better than anyone else's sermon in the class because the Spirit of God had anointed it. That's what we need to be asking for is God's anointing as we do His kingdom work in building in unity. Amen? Amen. I, I hope you all have a great week. We're going to continue this series next week. Again, your homework for the week is go back and reread all of 1 Corinthians. And as you're reading chapter 3 and 4, uh, read it in that lens of how Paul is kind of really getting on to these Corinthians as well. Be blessed. Y'all have a good week. Thank you for joining us today. Please stay connected with us throughout the week at firstmethodist.church, also on Facebook and Instagram, and we hope to see you next week.